where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world. Three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games from our childhood to try to take another look at what we fell in love with. As always, I'm Tim, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Nick and Dean. Hello there. Also, hello there. We'll be recording this entire episode from the tops of our desks because today is the 1990s favorite, Tremors. We're not safe on the top of our desks either. <laughs> the, the True. It's the ultimate, the floor is lava movie. <laughs> We're not safe in a pickup truck. Good thing um, my pogo stick is broken somewhere. <laughs> I So we'll get to it, but I'm just baffled that even after they realize that something's amiss, they're like, oh, we have to figure out a plan. Yeah, Mindy, you can go back outside and continue pogoing. That's fine. <laughs> Unless she's like, Mindy, you are costing me way too much money. Get on out yeah, there. It was definitely after like... They realized there was a dangerous was new animal like out there. Deaths. <laughs> she takes after her grandfather, you know, so preoccupied on <laughs> whether or not you could, didn't stop to think whether or not you should. <laughs> so Tremors was a childhood favorite. I know on the last episode, I had said we were going to do Crawl and that I had my whole season planned out and I wasn't going to deviate from it. And yeah. You said, oh, yeah, what yes, happened to will. that? So recently, Fred Ward. I'm sorry, what away. did I say? You said that I definitely will deviate from it. <laughs> so recently Fred Ward passed away, who plays Earl in this movie, one of the main characters. And I was discussing Fred Ward the other day after it happened, like after I had heard about it. And I started talking about Tremors and it was a reminder of I watched Tremors so many times as a kid. But I think it was one of the movies that I never actually taped off TV it was on like USA Network and Sci-Fi Channel so often as a child that I didn't need to tape it. It was just, we come in from playing outside, I sit down, turn on the TV, oh hey, Tremors is on. And we just sit and watch the rest of Tremors. I actually credit the sequel to my appreciation for behind the, the camera, behind the scenes stuff. Because when the sequel came out, HBO had a rare behind the scenes segment of how they were doing like the puppeteering and the special effects work with how they were able to do the above ground graboids. And I was so enthralled by it as a kid. I think that was the first exposure to seeing real behind the scenes. How This is how we made the movie stuff. And I just thought it was so cool that I think ever since then, that's when I started to really hunt for behind the scenes stuff and get into how movies are actually made and appreciate them more than just what you see in front of you. Which I think HBO did that for a couple movies. Because I remember, I think on our VHS tape, when we taped Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I think there was like a little segment also on the behind the scenes of Turtles, which is just kind of cool to have a little bit of an added extra, almost like if you were to watch it off a DVD or watch it off something and get bonus features. I wish they did that more on a lot of things i know for a lot of hbo shows now if you watch them it's stay after the show for some behind the scenes and interviews so dean when did you hear of or find tremors uh i was probably around the same age as use use guys use guys use as use um youths (laughs) oh no youth yeah i was like i was a kid when i saw it um i don't think i've before today, I don't think I had seen it. Oh, God. I might have had single-digit age. Uh, oh, wow. Well, I don't know. Might have, maybe, maybe 10, 11, 12, something like that. All I can... <laughs> the first thing I think of when I think of Tremors is uh, the TV edit swearing. <sighs> I think my favorite is when Fred Ward is like, Jesus Christ, and instead he's like, Judas Priest. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. I think we could do an entire, we should do a rule of thirds on favorite TV edits. <laughs> when you find a stranger in the Alps. Yeah, but like, <laughs> that'd be up there. But 
I, I guess the originally Tremors, they wanted to dial it back a little bit because there was a lot more language in the movie. And you can definitely tell because even when you watch the like the I bought it digitally. If you watch like the DVD and whatnot, they have certain lines dubbed, even though that's not like the dubbed version TV version. It's the actual movie because there's so many parts that they had a lot more F-bombs throughout the film. And then they were like, dial it back a little bit. We want to keep this like a PG-13 type scenario um, or whatever the case is. Or at it least still like, was, drop it's the still language. It's still R, isn't it? I think they just wanted to drop the language more okay. on it. So that's why sure. like, you can... I think the clearest one is when it attacks the Gummer house and they kill it, and then they call on the radio, and they're like, oh, we killed the Mother Humpers. And then it cuts to Kip and Bacon, <laughs> yeah. and he's like, well, there's a couple more Mother Humpers out there right now, and you yeah, see they, his mouth, and it's like, right. oh, they, they definitely dumped yeah. you for this. They're not. He's not yelling, fuck you, at a dead tremor, and then later saying Mother Humper. <laughs> yeah. So I no, think I it was noticed just... That. Yeah, it was just like, be selective with what you have. Part of the reshoots, actually, for this movie, they went back and had Fred Ward apologize for each time he swore. <laughs> yeah, they added in all of the, pardon my French, they just, they didn't want to offend. It's PG-13, not R. Oh, is it? Okay, so yeah, so they were cutting it is down. Is it really? To get oh, so they yeah. just, oh, so they just had the one, they still, they, even in the 90s, they gave you one fuck to get PG-13? I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's one, but it can't be in any sexual connotation. It just has to be right. the word itself. They actually right. do it okay. as kind of a a meta joke in the sequel to Get Shorty and Be Cool. John Travolta is in the car driving with James Woods. Do you know that unless you're willing to use the R rating, you can only say the F word once? You're kidding me. No. You know what I say? Fuck that. I'm done. And it's like, ah, it's a PG-13 movie, and that's his only one, while he explains PG-13 movies. <laughs> well, in X-Men First Class, Wolverine says, Excuse me, I'm Eric Lentra. Charles Xavier. Go fuck yourself. But I guess that's that's not sexual. Is that, I mean, it can be construed as sexual, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's, I think, far enough down the line that the ruling might have <laughs> loosened quite a bit. That's true. Because it was really rare to drop the f-bomb back then because i think the only time i ever noticed it was in um armageddon and then Which before was? and after that it was um uh what's his name sling blade um Billy Bob Thornton. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i guess we that's gotta just... stop this here asteroid <laughs> french fried potatoes <laughs> He was being told to just detonate the nuke, and he was like, This is one order you shouldn't follow, and you fucking know it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was impactful, yeah. They use it, I don't remember they use hearing. it very, very good times. Yeah, and I don't know any other PG-13 movies growing up that really had an F-bomb, and that was one of the few of them, so. And now it seems like all of them know they have one, and they try to use it. Yeah, like it's, now it's, let's save it for a specific time. I'd rather they do that than throw in Wilhelm scream, so. No, I want the Howie scream and everything. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> it's like the I think we hit our of screams. <laughs> yeah, that's a good comparison. Yeah! Oh, yeah, so, I think we hit our F-bomb quota for the episode. I won't say it again. Otherwise, we get an R podcasts get a lot more so growing up as i said tremors was always on nonstop. it was on everything we saw the sequel and then enjoyed it i think the sequel is underrated it's still very fun overall and kind of continues the whole feel of this one once they get into like three and four and all of those and like the there was a 2003 sci-fi series that lasted i believe a, a season or something like that Michael Gross, I think, is the only person who really came back for everything who plays Burt Gummer in this because he came back for the 2003 series. He came back for all the sequels. He came back for all the direct video sequels, like everything he's in it for it. But after two, it kind of loses me a bit personally. If you guys dig it, great. Just not necessarily something in my rotation. I don't. I'm just scanning the, the 
a scene of Tremors 2. I don't know if I've ever seen this one. Fred Ward is in this one too. And then I think he drops off for th- <laughs> the rest of them. Yeah, he's only he only returns in two. And I think they I think they wrote off Kevin Bacon in that one by explaining that him and Rhonda left together uh, based on how this one goes. But they do have the fun little, I think, People magazine cover in Earl's house that has him and Val. Like, oh, yeah, that, that's cool. Together. Not National Geographic. <laughs> yeah, so like at least if they write him out for a sequel, it's not like, oh, where is he? Oh, he couldn't make it. It's, Couldn't pay you know, like money. He, there's an explanation behind it. So yeah, I think the, the second one's still fun, but after that, it just kind of loses me. I think Shooting Jamie Footloose Kennedy too. is in one of them at some point as like a graboid hunter. I don't know. So people's, Jamie, people's pranks on the tremors. Yeah. He is um, Malibu's most wanted of the, <laughs> I don't know enough of his stuff other than scream to really make a joke about that. <laughs> so January 19th, 1990 is when this originally started and overall i think it was the one of the higher grossing for the month of january i think it got beat out by internal affairs with richard Gere and um the other one that's not richard oh andy (laughs) garcia and And the rest (laughs) and the rest of them so it made about 16.6 million dollars i know i believe kevin bacon in interviews previously had referred to it as like it, it didn't do well at the box office but everybody seemed because people love it now They seem to think that it did much better than it actually did back then. But I know he seems to be very appreciative of the fun of doing this movie from the sounds of it, which is nice to hear. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a fun movie. But it released against Braindead with the Bills, Bill Pullman and Bill Paxton. If you've ever seen that one, it's a a wacky kind of horror sci fi. It's only one Braindead in my mind. Oh, yeah, that zombie thing or whatever it is i never heard give you the satisfaction (laughs) i never heard of this one with the bills i've only seen it once i remember liking it but i haven't gone back to it in i don't know like almost two decades no that's a lie in almost a decade (laughs) i haven't gone back to it since i was how old you were (laughs) yeah i was gonna say i don't think i was watching this back then but also january 1990 it was competing against texas chainsaw massacre 3 Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, and a fun little Italian film, Cinema Paradiso. If anybody has a, That's a is great willing movie. to read subtitles and has a love of film, watch that movie. It's about a little boy growing friendship with his, the projectionist at a theater and learning about film and learning to love the, the art of film. And it's a great little gem, uh, personally. The so. climax of that movie is like my kind of <laughs> it's my kind of climax. I know that just sounds terrible, but <laughs> it's <laughs> that <laughs> it's true. It's just uh, like a, a feel good climax. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh huh. Oh man. You got any more? God damn it. <laughs> It's a great movie. Okay, there we go. (laughs) So find it and watch it. So Tremors, directed by Ron Underwood, who also did the was involved in the story for this, uh, written by S.S. Wilson and Brent Maddock. They all seem to work together for a lot of their, or at least the two writers, S.S. Wilson and Brent Maddock, seem to work together for a lot of their stuff. And there were a couple things that crossed over with their work with Ron Underwood. Like Ron directed Heart and Souls with Robert Downey Jr. and um, Charles Grodin and Tom Sizemore and everyone from there. And S.S. Wilson and Brent Maddock both wrote it. So they had that connection. I think that I don't know if that may be where they met or what the case is, but then they ended up all working together on this one. But Ron Underwood had a lot of TV kind of after all of this film stint by this point. Um, doing Tremors. He also did, as I said, Heart and Souls. He did City Slickers. He did Mighty Joe Young. Uh, The, I think, ABC movie, Sunday movie or something of Runaway Ralph and the Mouse with a Motorcycle. And the often maligned The Adventures of Pluto Nash, which I only know by reputation and I've never seen. That's going to come up eventually. Yeah, I've never seen that either. I liked it. I don't, that's one of those, I don't understand the, 
overall hate bandwagon, but this was before the internet, so it is bad. Yeah, like I've only ever heard of it, and I've just not heard terrific things, but I've never watched it myself. So I would be interested in not revisiting it just to kind of see. Because, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that once it becomes popular to bandwagon against it, that it's, hey, I'm part of the joke. If I take a dunk on whatever this movie is, it, it kind of takes the fun out of it. I mean, it's certainly not one of his best, but I still think like epic movie is a thousand times worse than Pluto Nash. Yeah. I mean, even out of his own filmography, I think he would definitely have like Norbit or some of those other ones. Like I mm. think probably would fall lower. I think they're much lower uh, effort than something like that. So S.S. Wilson, Brent Maddox. So as I said, they did a lot of work together. Actually, all of their writing work from I, what I see is all of them as a pair. So they did, as I said, Heart and Souls. They did Wild Wild West. They did the the fun little batteries not included. And they did a screen refresh favorite, Short Circuit. Oh. Huh. So when you watch Tremors and you're like, it just seems so familiar. It's I didn't that. Get that they wrote Short Circuit. I didn't feel that whatsoever. Two, I'm actually two more sides surprised. Of the same coin. <laughs> Yeah, wasn't Melvin like a robot? Yeah. <laughs> Melvin sure was something. We'll get to Melvin. <laughs> they were all about no disassemble and short circuit. And then in this one, that's all they wanted to do. <laughs> disassemble Melvin. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I just want a sure super did. cut of every time in the movie, somebody's like, Melvin, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> you shit stain. <laughs> <laughs> like I just have a note every single time that everybody and it's not just one person it's like I'm gonna go out there and beat Melvin and somebody else is like <laughs> I'll go help you <laughs> everybody like grabs bats it's like that scene in an airplane everybody's lined up with a weapon just <laughs> waiting to hit Melvin <laughs> like the Simpsons treehouse of horror kill the boy you know he's a vampire he's a vampire <laughs> <laughs> I forget about that so like we said, before we kind of get into this, so Fred Ward plays Earl Bass. He, Him and Kevin Bacon, who plays Valentine McKee, are our two leads in this film as kind of the the rough and tumble everyman, handyman of this town of perfection. And they are dreaming of bigger and better things. Fred Ward, unfortunately, just recently passed away. But he, aside from this, I this and the sequel are the two things that personally I always knew him from. But he certainly had other things like Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins. He was Remo Williams. Uh, Shortcuts, the Robert Altman film. But he was in Miami Blues with Alec Baldwin. And he was in The Right Stuff with everyone else. And then Kevin Bacon. I think everybody knows Kevin Bacon. Who? The guy from Friday the 13th, part one. <laughs> Animal He's hunts. done some other stuff since then. Who's he been in with? Uh, yeah, who else was in that? I don't know who else was in it, but I know in six steps I can get back to yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, speaking of Kevin Bacon, if you guys have never seen the film Stir of Echoes, it's worth checking out. I saw that back, I think, when it was released on video. It's like kind of ghost, ghostly stuff, right? Yeah, where he gets like hypnotized at a party. And then when he comes out of it, he's starting to like see visions and he starts to get obsessed with tracking down what they mean. And he thinks that he's being told the answer to a murder that happened. Right. It's all coming back to me. I mean, he's been at a bunch of other stuff, but those are the two things that uh, I think he should be known for are his Friday 13th part one, where he gets an arrow <clears throat> through his neck and stir of echoes. Not hollow man <laughs> or hollow man. I mean, I guess he was also in footloose. <laughs> so aside from them, just kind of a quick run through on everybody. Also, Finn Carter is Rhonda LeBeck. She's the uh, geology student. Actually, seismology. Earthquakes. Who is out there doing tests in the desert that they end up meeting. Uh, she was, if anybody ever saw the movie How I Got Into College. Michael Gross that we mentioned, Burt Gummer. He's the uh, paranoid survivalist who you might know from Family Ties. He was the father on Family Ties. And his wife, Reba McIntyre, is Heather, who you should know Reba McIntyre. She had the, <laughs> the TV series, Reba. Also, she has two songs that appear in this film, on a radio and then on the end credits. I didn't remember that 
either she or Victor Wong was in this movie until it's until we got to them. Oh, I definitely remembered Reba was in this. The the two that I definitely forgot were in this uh, was Victor Wong and Ariana Richards. I didn't until, remember her. As I never girl. noticed it until watching it, like actually this go around and being like, wait a second, is that is that what's her name from <laughs> Jurassic Park? Uh, and it is. It's just a slightly younger version. So Ariana Richards plays Mindy, the kid who's just crazy about pogo sticks. <laughs> and Victor Wong, a uh, personal favorite of mine. I love seeing him pop up and stuff. He plays Walter Chang, owner of the general store. You might know him from Big Trouble in Little China. You might know him from Prince of Darkness. And then lastly, we have uh, Charlotte Stewart, who plays Nancy, the mother of Mindy in this um, that the only I just know her from kind of her work with David Lynch. If you've ever seen Eraserhead, she was Mary X. If you've ever watched Twin Peaks, she was Betty. Hmm. So, yeah. So I think we got through all the the preamble as far as this. Uh, just something to keep in mind throughout this film, that the Graboid sounds are recycled for Predator 2 and Starship Troopers. Or actually, I think the I think Predator 2 came out prior to this. No, this is 1990, so I think it would have been after. So if anything, these sounds got recycled for those movies. And then the creation of the Graboids, which I love the look of them the, and the just the hard armored exterior that's like a hard leather, but they're dusty, but then the insides are that gooey. So Amalgamated Dynamics is the group that made the Graboids for this. Then they would later go on to win an Academy Award for their visual effects in Death Becomes Her, which... I may do eventually. What movie was Graboids coined? This one. This they one. say Graboid in this movie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. After they discover the tongue, they're trying to think of a name for it. Gotcha. I missed that. Yeah. Because Melvin's... Call them Tremors. Because <laughs> actually for years I used to call them Tremors. And I think even now I still usually refer to them as Tremors. Even though like I know they're Graboids. It just Tremors sounds cooler. Because at one point they're trying to think of the name and then Melvin says something like groundoids. And then Walter says, oh, oids, oids. Okay, we can do that. And then he like, I think, comes up with graboids. That's what I like. Graboid. That's it. Graboid. Jesus, Walter. We're going to be sorry. Don't give it a name. (laughs) As he's being pulled underground, he's just like, I have one last idea. (laughs) Graboids. Okay, so how about we get into this thing? We get the the introduction to Earl and Val. Um, as we said, Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward, the, the two kind of handymen for the town, they do a bit of everything, it seems. I never realized that the movie opens where it eventually ends. So at the beginning, when Kevin Bacon is like standing over at the, the cliff edge, you can see in the background the rocks that they eventually end up climbing onto at the end of the movie. Yeah, I just realized this too because i had the movie open and was like oh that's the end of the movie <laughs> bookends it's always fun to see bookends um as far as that a little movie secret they probably shot it on the same day all that shit no they they shoot everything <laughs> in script order yeah. um in hollywood no too. matter how conven- inconvenient it is yes yeah. <laughs> so like if the movie opens in europe and then everything takes place in like australia <laughs> And then at the end of the movie, they're like going back to their house in Europe. They have to fly the entire crew out (laughs) twice. I know it's not cost effective, but it's just how they do things. So I love the Earl and Val relationship that we get the example of like immediately that it's just, okay, we know the two guys work together. But then Val finds Earl sleeping in the back of the truck. He tries to wake him up. And then instead, he just jumps up and down on the truck yelling stampede. And then after Earl gets up and complains that, oh, I was once in a stampede, as he starts to tell the story, Val just tells the story for him and continues along. And I think it kind of just that sets up their dynamic this entire film. They had a good chemistry. How hot was that sleeping bag? Yeah, I was gonna say, who gets an, I mean, unless he just uses it to protect his body from the sun, but then you're just essentially, (laughs) that's that's true. You're just baking yourself in that thing. (laughs) Well, no, I'm assuming they slept through the night and it gets freezing in the desert, so. That's true. So, yeah, so as I said, like, I like the relationship that we have between Val and Earl that will kind of continue through this whole thing. Also, we set up the first point where 
Mel and Earl are deciding who has to make breakfast. They're arguing, oh, I made it yesterday. So they decide it with rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors will come in a lot throughout the rest of this movie for them, which to some fun effects um, as far as the results of some of these. So my mind went somewhere else. Fun effects. There's explosions every time they (laughs) smash fists and then. Every time, every time he does scissors, there's like this app anime style slash sequence. You hear the noise. <laughs> it sounds like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers gloves. <laughs> Sound design really doesn't match the film. <laughs> <laughs> Less that and more tumbleweeds. <laughs> so they're driving to get to the, the next job. They're talking about how Earl is a planner. Val always is kind of by the, the seat of his pants. And Val notices that they have a new grad student that he doesn't know who it is out there doing testing out in the desert. So he pulls the vehicle off road to go meet the new grad student that's doing these tests because he realizes that, wait a second, the new grad student's supposed to be a woman. Oh, so this is when we end up meeting Rhonda. So Val and Earl end up finishing up. They go to Walter's store, uh, which Walter Chang, and they talk with Bert and Heather, the Gummers. They kind of introduce all of these characters And then we set up that Walter's freezer for all of the ice cream and whatnot acts up. And we see it shaking. Uh, Chekhov's freezer. It will never come back again. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Okay. Which, I mean, it's. They explain it during this scene that it doesn't just. I hate it in movies when it's something that's just like a non sequitur. It's just a one off of. Oh, by the way, uh, my car never starts. And then they just continue on, and then it's like, oh, that'll come back later. <laughs> yeah. At least no, here, yeah, it, it. Con- it continues the conversation they had earlier of like the planning in advance and the jobs that they have and all of this. And then when Walter ends up hearing it, and he's like, hey, it's been acting up. Uh, can you guys work on this? It's nope, no can do, can't work on it. We'll take a look at it next week. And then that's when Val gets his whole line of, oh, yeah. See, we plan ahead. That way we don't do anything right now. Earl, explain it to me. So at least it has something that isn't readily obvious of, oh, this is going to come back. It's, okay, so it kind of makes sense with the conversation. It continues that whole thing. But it's not this obvious, like, weight that's going to be sitting on this movie for the next 40 minutes to come back and haunt us. So it was not Chekhov's gun. It was not. It was good writing. So... We meet Bert. I always liked Bert growing up. And he explains how he's distrustful of the government. Rewatching this now and after over the years watching like King of the Hill, Bert really reminds me of what Dale aspires to be. I thought they were the same person. (laughs) Like this is the live action version of Dale. I think Bert is just like more, not I would say successful, but he's more accomplished in it. Of he has all of these plans in place and he has all this stuff and blockades and barricades where I think at the end of the day, if something happened, Dale would not be as prepared as <laughs> no. Bert is. Although I would I thought, love Bert to get a graboid with pocket sand. I remembered Bert being like more of a shithead, but he's not really in this movie. He's no, no. I mean, the, the only I mean, just real thing they probably played it up like one argument later on, but yeah. Cause I think the only real time in this movie is towards the, the end when they get into the argument yeah. of like, Hey, we could have done something back at the house and you dragged us out here. Yeah. But I mean, that lasts like a second and it's over. And he had a legitimate argument, though. But it, at the same time, when you unload half of your entire reservoir of ammunition into one, is that really a victory? Yeah. Well, they killed 33% of the enemies. Or at that point, I think so. Yeah, because then there were two left. So yes, Bert is distrustful of the government. We go back to Rhonda, who this, I think, was not originally intended to be presented just yet so we see Rhonda going back to her car and then we get the pov of something kind of out there but then we even see the underground effect of the ground lifting up and following behind her which if i recall that wasn't originally intended and then was added on later at i think like the the studio request or something because they didn't want it to be more of a surprise later they wanted from the get-go people to be like Nope, this is a monster movie. There is a monster under there that's out in the the desert. Where originally it was supposed to be, oh, you don't see what attacks, like, puts Edgar up there. You don't see what attacks old Fred. You don't see what's, like, going after Rhonda. It's 
just mystery. It was almost like the Book of the Dead was opened up for a second. I mean, even in Jaws, you don't see the shark, but you still see the fin at least. Yeah. Although in Jaws, I think from the get go, you know what's what's in there. Mm. And Dean, you said something about what the Evil Dead. I said, yeah, they it, in this scene they opened up the Book of the Dead for for a few <laughs> seconds. It is. It's, it's like a Sam like, Raimi directing the scene. It's a very Raimi like floating <laughs> handheld cam. Every time I see it, it's always just it's. Terrific. I loved when they used that in multiverse recently. The the old Evil Dead shtick. In this movie, in this instance, I can't help but just think of like, I just know the cameraman's holding a camera just walking around with it low to the ground. But I mean, it's it's still, it's fine. Yeah, just uh, walk pretty fast and then we'll speed it up in post. Uh, now we have to bury you and run as fast as you can towards her. What? <laughs> So, yeah, so evidently the studio wanted more monster stuff, so they kind of made it more apparent earlier to try to really play up that of, hey, we can do the trailers and we can really kind of publicize the whole angle of, oh, it's a a big screen monster movie, which it's a great monster movie. Um, I would have seen it regardless as a kid if they said, oh, we don't know what's in the ground. Although then when they came out with the poster, no, you kind of know what's underground oh is um, that that's like the movie poster the, the yeah, teeth and the everything movie. yeah okay so i think the studio kind of ruined any plans for any level of mystery there with here's a giant graboid on the poster coming out of the ground <laughs> it's like they forgot that jaws existed <laughs> i mean it's, it's jaws on land well they did do a little i just mean like yeah because the poster is of the thing looking tongue and not the actual main graboid itself. So I, I just realized I it doesn't have teeth. And then when you look at the poster, it does. <laughs> what if it didn't have sharp teeth in the poster and it was like normal square teeth? <laughs> <laughs> like when you see those pictures of dogs with human teeth. Oh, um, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it comes out the ground. What I meant by them not re- realizing seeing Jaws was like, like produce the Studio being like, yeah, it, it works when you don't show the shit up front. It wakes. So Val and Earl are on garbage duty, uh, still kind of arguing over what they need to do with their lives and that there's other things they should be doing. And they go to Melvin's family trailer, which I always thought that like Nancy and Nestor were like Melvin's parents or something. Yeah. what? But I guess they're not. Who Who does he live with? I don't know. Like, is it just his parents were like, we've had enough of you. And then he's like, you're going to send me away. And they're like, no, we're going to send us away later. Melvin. We're leaving this. Trailer's house yours. You. <laughs> it's not us. It's you. So yeah, they're at Melvin's family trailer and they're setting up to drain the sewage when it springs a leak on them. And that's kind of the final straw because then they decide to pack up the truck and leave town and decide we're going to Bixby. We're going to start a new life and do our thing, which terrific. Uh, I sure I don't know where Bixby is, but I'm sure it can use two handymen. So Nancy and her daughter, Mindy, the pogo champ of Perfection County, decide that they're going to stop them and they try to seal the deal with free beer of, hey, don't leave town. We got a job for you. Stick around, work with us. It might be kind of a a couple months work. And they resist that urge and continue on to Bixby. Which, after so many times of them getting stopped in the next 20 minutes in this movie, you almost feel bad for them of, you know what, we had enough, let's leave town. And then it's like one thing, then the next thing, then a third thing, then a fourth thing. It's At that point, it seems more like divine intervention, keeping them, them locked in perfection. They also got covered in Melvin's family's shit. We don't know where his family is. That might just be Melvin's. <laughs> just... Purely well, jokes on him because even though it's sprayed <laughs> everywhere and melvin started laughing at him it's like well dude you have shit all over the side of your house now they can just drive away <laughs> a quick shower and they're done you have to scrub your house that sucks. <laughs> melvin just torches it it's septic by the way it's not just like melvin shit on them 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you went over that part. Sorry if I missed it. I didn't. I didn't really specify specifically <laughs> what um, made up this substance coming out of their drain pipe. <laughs> so yeah, so they end up leaving town completely. Like they they bypass the Nancy and Mindy wall, and they end up going and finding Edgar Deems up on the power lines, who is kind of evidently a. I wouldn't say like the the town drunk, but they definitely mention that he has a proclivity for drinking. So they do, again, rock, paper, scissors, part two, to see who has to climb up there and go check on old Edgar. And when they go up there, they find Edgar dead. So number two, as far as the things that are preventing them from leaving town. I didn't remember this part at all. Like, I mean, there's lots of the movie I didn't remember, but just like this seemed like an event. I was like, oh, I didn't remember. Anybody that was found dead, I didn't remember about this movie. <laughs> just the tremors. <laughs> it isn't just everybody just kind of like running through town. They find a new animal and then they just all leave. <laughs> I guess originally, I don't know if it was filmed or if it was just part of the the plans, that there was supposed to be the scene of Edgar talking with like old Fred, the other farmer or something. And they end up like the the goat or something gets eaten and that's what spooks Edgar and he starts running after he sees it and he climbs up there but they decided I guess cut that for time or something or not do that for time which I right I think at the end of this like it still serves its purpose of yeah if anything it serves it better of us not knowing what put Edgar up there I think it yeah, would have no, been I better agree. if we didn't see the scene with Rhonda of the thing coming through the ground at that point cuz this, this would be kind of the first introduction of, yeah, something's amiss here. That's a good why point. Why is this guy up there by himself? And why was he up there to the point where he died of dehydration? Yeah, and it's only like 13, 14 minutes into the movie. And it's like, yeah, unraveled a little bit slower. I did like the false reveal because the whole time you're thinking it's just an oversized snake. Yeah. And then it's like, nope, that's just one of the tongues. <laughs> Yeah, that was good. I couldn't remember. I was like, oh, are there different sizes? And then I, yeah, it was still a surprise to me. I forgot what they look like. It's actually just they have a psychic thing that drives people to climb up high places and then die of dehydration. It's like the happening. (laughs) Much different film. So, yeah. So also this at this point when they're kind of doing all the shots outside, there's only two kind of real interior scenes throughout the movie. I think it's like Walter's place. And then the the Gummer place. Um, but seeing all of the filming that's done outdoors and kind of on location for all of this, it was fun to see actual mountains and desert and sky behind them. Because I've gotten so used to the past couple of years of all of this being done out of a studio or being done in some like location in more towards the city in California or like Atlanta or Toronto and they digitally add all these mountains and blue skies here. So it's just, right. it's a welcome break to see like actual location stuff. Back in my day, we actually had a shoot on site on location. Got none of this magic <laughs> blue screen tomfoolery. Because <laughs> I mean, when it's done well, it's terrific. But also there's so many times where there's just something about it that you can just tell yeah, this isn't, like, they're not actually here. Even when it's cases where it's not, like, something fantastical, like Game of Thrones or something like that. If it's just a normal show, you can still usually tell when there's something amiss that they added into it. They usually always end up getting the lighting slightly off that throws the whole thing into this weird, uncanny valley, surreal time. I like how a lot of the times, too, they'll decide out of an entire movie, let's go into the most remote part of Taiwan, into the deep jungles for this four minute scene. And then the entirety rest of it, which is seems to be a lot easier to do. They would just rather shoot it, you know, in the back lot studio or do like the green screen. But no, we want to make sure that we're on location for the stuff that seems almost trivial sometimes. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if it's just a case of there's people that want to go to this location. So it's, oh, yeah, we actually have to shoot the next part in, like, I don't know, Cancun. We know that the script, like, we can't CGI Cancun. They're going to be able to tell that it's not Cancun. Let's fly all of us out there. There's an alarming amount of stuff that is 
uh, green screen, I guess you could say, special effects. Like, people just be walking down a city street, or like as a wide shot of a city street, and it's like most of the city down the street is CGI'd in, and there's like, it's like an alley or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when it's you know, done it's like well an, and correctly, it's great. Game of Thrones did that a lot, and, you know. That's understandable because they have to, it's a different world. But where, like, sometimes they're just they like, could have. They could have found real life analogs to film some of the stuff or built the sets they, and they didn't. They did in, in in some regards. They just they like augmented real locations. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, there I mean, I think the the biggest one that always annoys me is when you see somebody in a car and you can obviously tell that they just CGI'd what's going on outside the car because it just never seems realistic. Dean, what's our favorite line? Just quick little Left and right movement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> you guys got to watch that movie. Um, no. Back in my day, we shot in script order. We went from Europe to Australia to China. Odd location. <laughs> back to Europe order. and then back to Australia. And then rewrites, <laughs> which put us back in Australia. <laughs> And then we ended up doing the entire movie in Canada because it's script version three. <laughs> so evidently, Edgar was supposed to be um, meeting this guy, as we said, like he was going to meet the farmer and then that was going to get him over onto the power lines. And they decided to kind of cut that whole piece. So this is the first time we end up kind of meeting Edgar and he's dead up on there. So they bring him to the doctor. And this is when we meet the doctor and his wife, who are currently kind of in a a trailer on their land as they're working on building their new house outside of town. And they let them know. Was it a heart attack, doctor? No. Died of dehydration. Thirst. Oh, that doesn't make any sense. That takes a couple of days, doesn't it? Maybe even three or four. (laughs) You mean he sat up there three or four days? He sat up there and just died of thirst? So, yeah, so old Fred... Um, we, we end up after finding out that Edgar's dead, we then get introduced to old Fred before old Fred gets it as well. And he's farming with his goats or whatever. And he ends up getting (laughs) sucked on under into the underworld. Whatever goat farmers do (laughs) in the Nevada desert. (laughs) So Val and Earl end up showing up and now they find old Fred. They see his hat on the ground, lift his hat up and they find his head right there which I assume is still attached. I doubt they just ate his head and left it perfectly there. So they probably just sucked him straight down and just left him. It's like, it's like um, leaving the tail on the, on the shrimp, you know, you just pop, <laughs> pop it out. Or maybe they're coming back for it. I don't know. <laughs> we put the hat on so the sun wouldn't ruin his face. <laughs> Leftovers. I love Kevin Bacon's reaction. He's like, what the, he's like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Like, it was very Which, genuine. Like, it, it felt I, Yeah, because, I mean, real. at this point, it's what, like, three, th- the, it's, oh, we, our neighbors stopped us to try to get us to do a job and not go out of town, and it's, we're going to move on. We find a body. We find a second body. And I like how, even after finding the second body, they end up finding these road workers on the way to Bixby that they end up warning Hey, there's there's a bunch of bodies out there. There's something going on, which this was a cool effect as far as the the road workers are jackhammering. And we don't know yet, but they are attracted to noise, seeing as they are underground. So the jackhammer ends up going into one of them and you see the jackhammer stand up straight and there's like blood. And then it just takes off through the land like it's (laughs) like swimming and the cable ends up wrapping around one of the guys and drags him off into the distance and up over the hill. And then his other friend runs after him but gets caught in a rock slide and both of them end up dying. And with both of them dying, it also ends up destroying, I guess, the the road out of town. Womp womp. womp, womp. I love the Fred Ward's like, get out of town. There's a crazy killer on the loose. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean, it's like, that's also realistic. It's just like, it's interesting that they showed that. I don't know. Get out yeah, of town. I mean, There's somebody killing people. Get, there, get the hell out of here. There's a killer on the loose. What? A murderer, man. A real psycho. He's, 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 he's cutting people's heads off. I'm not kidding. They're pulling our chain. Yeah. 
I mean, personally, if somebody came and was like, there's a murder about stop working, I'd just stop working. I'd yeah. have to call I mean, my that, boss and be the like, one guy hey, wants I'd to love to, but there's a murderer about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he goes and grabs a crowbar. He's like, okay, maybe there's something to this. <laughs> or he walks over and then kills his friend, and he's like, this is the perfect cover. There's a murderer in town. <laughs> Or I would love to have seen him fight off a graboid with a a crowbar and he comes back at the end of the movie. So Val and Earl, they end up warning the crew. They get back to Walter's for the first or second time to this movie. They tell him about old Fred's death. Everybody knows about the, the multiple deaths now at this point. And they are tasked with trying to drive out of town to get help. But this is when they end up hitting the, the road outage from the workers that we had mentioned. Um, they a lot of brains and hard hats in this film. They just see the yeah the hard hats didn't do shit. Yeah, they need that, but like all over their body. The goggles they do nothing. <laughs> they do nothing. <laughs> so yeah, so they end up getting tasked with getting out of town. But now there's no road to get out of town, uh, especially in their trucks. Which I didn't take a look at the landscape enough to see. Like, could you just go off the road and go around it? But I guess it's too rocky. Yeah. So Val gets the car stuck trying to get away and manages to rock it loose and head back to Walter's where they end up finding that the whole thing that kind of stuck them there was this tentacle mouth thing that's hanging off the rear axle, which I like how Walter then haggles with them to buy it off them. (laughs) And then he starts charging for photos with it. (laughs) I don't see his idea being great only because... There's only a population of 14 people. <laughs> he just got all of his customers just in the afternoon and that's it. Yeah. He is now uh, $6. No, uh, he only gained $6 and he still, <laughs> he never makes up his, his uh, deficit. And he's got to deal with burying the remains when it comes to no. deteriorate. He eats it. <laughs> he gains its knowledge. Um, so yeah, so he ends up, then charging people for photos with it, which you spend $15. There's 10 people in town. You charge them each two bucks. You make a $5 profit. That's a 25% increase. If you do a lot of little hustles, you know, it adds up. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what the the average income in this town is, so that might be good. Um, $340.22. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, he ends up charging for photos with it. So, while they're all back at Walter's, we end up going back to the doctor and his wife, who are now calling it a night, kind of prepping the area for their new house. They decide, we're done. Let's just pack it in. We'll call it a night. We have more work to do tomorrow. And that's when their generator just dies on them. Which, when they investigate the generator, they end up seeing that the cord goes over and into the ground, never to be seen again. In which case, the doctor is then a big dummy who doesn't listen to his wife and decide that he wants to go investigate further before getting got. Yeah, this is this is one of those frustrating, like, white people checking out noises instead of running. Like, Yeah, because they hear all this I, action, and it's, yeah. I'm just going to go look at it. Why? There's don't? like an explosion in the ground. I'm like, oh, I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like... It's ridiculous. So he hears the noise. They see that the generator got sucked clean into the ground. And he's like, I'm going to go check it out. I just kind of want to see what it is. And then they smell this like stench. And it's, I'm still really interested. I'm going to go check out what it is. And then he also (laughs) gets sucked into the underworld while his wife is trying to like grab onto him and pull him back out. And he is a goner. Please, Jim. Maybe it's a geological thing of something like natural gas or, or a geyser. They stink like that. Remember in Yellowstone? Oh, come on! Oh, 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 yeah! Something's got to oh, oh, So we think that the wife is going to be safe because she's jumping into this car. She's going to take off. She doesn't have the keys. And now the entire car gets sucked into the ground. There's a cool image of the over the hill. You just see the headlights disappear one by one. Yeah. Also, it's a Reba song on the radio. <laughs> She's like the harbinger of death. It's like Jeepers Creepers. It's like, you hear that? You're Reba. Like, get the fuck out of there. <laughs> You're not wrong. I think there's only one time there's a song that plays in this movie that um, wasn't Reba 
that somebody didn't. Although it was the happiest part of the movie. Wait, was that a knock against Reba's music? <laughs> Just a billboard top something. So yeah, so they're gone and gone, which puts us back to Waltz again. So Bert thinks that they need to settle in and prepare to fight the things off, which he's not wrong if they, until they learned what exactly they specifically were. I think hunkering down with all of Bert's weapons probably wasn't a bad idea until that point. No, they were able to hold one off later, so. Yeah, which if they had the entire town armed to the teeth like Bert was, maybe? <laughs> Imagine Ariana Richardson just with, with an <laughs> AR-15. On the pogo stick still. <laughs> <laughs> she has a sh- shotgun. She doesn't even cock it. She just holds it straight, pogos, and it just cocks for her. <laughs> she does the Arnold like spin. <laughs> Terminator shotgun spin. So while Bird is saying that they need to fend these things off, Um, I think Miguel has the idea of riding the horses out to Bixby, which Val and Earl happen to be the two best at horseback riding, which I like how everybody (laughs) kind of pitches in together despite all of this. So it's like, yeah, you guys need to ride the horses. And they're like, well, Walter has the horses. And Walter's like, yeah, you can just have the horses. Just go. (laughs) So he he charged them for the snake. Yeah, the horses for free. (laughs) I'm just going to say, this is some questionable business practices here. Although, actually, he paid them for the snake, and then he gave them the horses for free. Yeah, so he's really underwater here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he wants to coin the term graboids. <laughs> Pretty soon, they're going to come for the, uh, the juice will stop flowing. <laughs> come for old Walter. So, yeah, Walter, what a guy. He gives them the horses to use. And then Earl ends up losing rock, paper, scissors, and Val ends up getting the rifle because they're divvying up who gets what gun. So Earl gets a pistol, Val gets the rifle, and then Heather immediately shows up and is like, wait, you're going to take that pistol out there? Here, actually take my gun. (laughs) She gives him his right or her rifle, which also I thought it was funny because then Walter walks by and hands them a package and he's like... Hey, Earl, here's some Swiss cheese and some bullets. Uh, Thanks, Walter. And just continues walking, and it's like, oh, okay, well, that's a weird care package to take out horseback riding. Are they the bullets that fit our gun, or are they just a random bunch of bullets? just bullets. They're musket balls. (laughs) Do you have a muzzle loader? They're armor-piercing (laughs) widow-makers. They're going to be launched out of a Barrett 50 cal. Take these tank shells... (laughs) <laughs> Maybe they'll come in handy. Yeah, take these. He just puts it on the horse. The entire thing just breaks in half. <laughs> Buttercup. <laughs> so at this point, Melvin runs out screaming, preventing to be attacked, and everybody gets ready to kick his ass. Part one. <laughs> there will be a refrain to this later. Melvin, one of these days somebody's going to kick your ass. So Valadorl ends up finding the doctor's land, but no doctor. Uh, But instead they hear a radio playing and they, which the radio is playing a song called Drop Kick Me Jesus Through the Goalposts of Life. (laughs) I'm getting that tattooed on me next week. (laughs) It's, um, I I don't know. What does that even mean? I caught that line and I was like, what is that? <laughs> I googled it and I was like, this is an actual song. Drop oh my kick God. me Jesus. Drop kick me Jesus to the goalpost of life. I want to check so everybody out. googled that, I guess. And listening to it, I didn't hate it. So yeah, so they end up hearing Drop Kick Me Jesus coming from underground. And this is when they dig up well, they don't dig up the car, but they dig up en- enough to find that the car it's like vertical underground at this point, which is kind of an interesting find in this instance. Yeah, I think once I saw the Ford emblem, I would have known, but they just keep going. I'm like, what, what could it be? <laughs> it could be anything then. Then, <laughs> And all of a sudden, it's just like, dun, 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 and then it cuts, and it's like the next day, and the entire <laughs> thing is back out. The wife is like, oh, thank you. <laughs> All I've had is Reba to keep me company in this uh, on this radio for 26 hours. I had one bullet left. I was going to take my own life. <laughs> That's like the Tremors Mist ending. 
<laughs> yeah, right as she shoots herself, they you know they the hand comes through the window in the dirt. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's alarming up- for them. They realize, oh, they can pull cars underground. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's. I think it would be one thing if it was just sunk underground. It's like, oh, it may be a sinkhole. But this, it's turned on its back and then sucked straight down vertically. It's a harder explanation to write off. Yeah. So Insurance that, is not going to believe this. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to send a guy out. Go ahead. <laughs> so Valander will take off to begin their trip to Bixby again. And Earl... <laughs> After the whole thing of rock, paper, scissors, and Heather's like, here, take my rifle. It's this caliber, and it does all this. And then Earl immediately loses the rifle because the horses get spooked, and he falls off, and he only has the pistol, and then the horse gets sucked below. And at this point, Val realizes that it's all coming from underground, and we finally get to see full Graboid, which (laughs) anybody who hasn't seen Tremors, like, it's a great monster movie. But it's just cool to see the the monster design itself. It's like this giant sightless armored worm with like a mouthful of tentacles a la alien. But it's really kind of a, a cool sight the way they design it here. And also I feel like all of the characters catch on fairly quick in this of what's going on, what's happening. So now that they know that they're underground, they are now taking off trying to get away from this thing. And this is when they end up seeing that there is a like a cement ditch coming up on the in the desert. So they both sprint for it and they jump off this thing. The graboid tries to follow them and then slams face first into this kind of concrete barrier and stupid son of a bitch knocked itself cold. Cold my ass. He's dead. I I really thought this thing wasn't dead. <laughs> it's just lying w- in wait. I guess I was surprised that it did kill itself. I know it was concrete. Um, the thing burrows through compacted ground. I figured it would have been able to go through, like, I don't know, cement wall, but guess not. I mean, also, if I run full force into a wall, I won't necessarily kill myself. <laughs> no, but you also can't uh, um, burrow through the through, ground. Yeah. It would be pretty dirt. messed up if we did that, though. <laughs> okay. TBI. Join us next time on Screen Refresh, where we all run full force into our, I was going to say local walls. The walls of wherever we live. Our local walls. Our local walls. Come Send us down, your favorite town. walls. So, yeah. So, it ends up slamming into this concrete barrier, killing itself. And then this is when Rhonda arrives, and they end up excavating the creature to inspect it. Val digs out the body to see how big this thing is. And I forgot how huge they are in this movie because Val is like digging out the body to see how long it is. And it's like, I don't know, 30 feet. It is giant compared to what I remember originally. (laughs) So I like how Earl ends up asking. Hey, Rhonda, you ever heard of anything like this before? Oh, sure, Earl. Everybody knows about them. We just didn't tell you. Oh, hell, man, no one ever saw anything like this. I know you guys mentioned the animatronics and stuff off the off the top, but I thought like, oh, it makes me wish that they still did animatronics. I guess to this extent, instead of just relying on CGI, I guess it's cheaper to do CGI. But damn, you you think you're some of these movies make money hand over fist? Just throw another million and or two and make I don't know, yeah, That's some goddamn like. Uh, rubber creatures in there the thing that gets me the most is like in this one i wasn't too impressed with the animatronics because it was the early 90s and it didn't seem like a really high budget film so i mean they did what they could but with the money that they throw at cgi nowadays you mean to tell me that we haven't had advances in that kind of technology like the real world like puppetry technology instead i don't know i mean i think the animatronics in this are better than jurassic park (laughs) <laughs> it's actually they did work I, on I jurassic think, park i think they're pretty good to, uh, personally i thought they were i mean for ha- what they had to, for how big the thing was and how it had to move i don't know if they did like any trick of the uh, perspective or anything like made smaller ones but made them appear big and so they didn't have to be as make huge creatures i don't know but yeah because between I the movements 
the like the puppeteering or the animatronics, the texturing of it, the goo of it, the um, goo, the goo, <laughs> the goo factor. Goo. I think it ends up at no point do I look at it, and I personally I thought like oh like it's I can clearly see where this thing is being puppeted and moved about. Yeah, it. I guess it feels dangerous to me. Doesn't feel I like I don't know. Well, agree to disagree. Fair. All right, internet. Do your thing. <laughs> Kill him. <laughs> I'm going to just cut this segment out myself. You're good, good luck. Good luck finding the audio with. I'll never match our audio up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you hate about it, Nick? Lay it on us. I just, I don't know. It just didn't tickle my fancy. The same that it does for its following. I don't know. Just, I didn't like evil dead. I think it's okay. It has a huge fan base. Just, I don't know. It's not for me. Do you not like Tremors because of all the sand? It's coarse and it gets everywhere. <laughs> no, I'd like the sequel better. First of all, the sequel's fun. <laughs> I like the sequel. I like the sequel a lot more than the first one. I didn't see the, the the first one until I was definitely an adult. Boo this man! I haven't seen the second one really in a long time, so I can't. I have no comment. I have no comment. Yeah, with this one, I don't know. It's just it, it was good at best. You know, if the acting was good. It was. Fun. It wasn't great, but I don't know. the The main thing I always remember from the second one is when they use the, the fire and- extinguishers to freeze. Um, I think it's like Fred Ward or something to yeah. have him go into the room because they see by heat. That's one I don't know if I would necessarily do it for the show, but I just at some point when I have free time in my life, I would probably sit down and watch Tremors too, just because I haven't seen it since I was a kid and I remember enjoying it. So it's at this point that Rhonda realizes there are multiple Graboids, which I like how because she's explaining the, oh, I have different readers in different locations. And when this one happened at like 2 a.m. or whatever it was, like this same exact thing happened over here. And I like how she doesn't even finish explaining everything. And Val and Earl immediately agree and like, no, like like, we trust you. We're on board with it. Like, let's just go. I like how everybody in this movie seems to just follow along with Here's my explanation. It sounds crazy. No, it's not crazy. We believe you. Let's go. And everybody is just all on board. There was never really a lot of time in this other than Melvin. So other than Melvin, everybody else is just like, no, yeah, like we trust you. We believe you. There's no infighting. There's no like, I don't trust this. I'm going to go run out of town. And then they get eaten. Everybody kind of does the best they can. And some people still end up dying. But at least it's not from... The stupidity of people denying that there's an underground monster. Right. They're pretty much, yeah. Everybody sees the writing on the wall. It's like pretty obvious evidence. Yeah. So they end up on a rock. So Rhonda, Earl, and Val. And the thing is kind of just circling them because they can't go down because it's going to be there. And they can't get all, or the, the thing can't get them on the rock because it, first of all, it's not sensing the vibrations of the rock. And also it can't travel directly through the rock. So they're just kind of held off there at this point. And then they just start spitballing ideas of where these things came from. Val thinks it's the government. It's a going to be a big surprise for the Russians. Earl thinks it's space. Rhonda decides that... If they're not in the fossil record, then they have to be from prior to that, which means they are billions of years old, which I like how they never solidly say what it is, at least in this film. I don't know if in like Tremors 5, they explain it, but at least in this one, we never get the explanation. And I think that ends up making it better overall as a monster. Like could be a meteorite. It could be something deep within the earth. It's an alien. You they came you from know. Hollow Earth. Hollow Earth. <laughs> they buried through, burrowed through. Did they? Did they ever explain it through the rest of the? They. Movie I stopped watching after. I think I watched part of three, or I might have watched three once when the the hype of like there's a Tremors three and it was like on Sci Fi Channel and I watched it. Um, I don't remember like hating it. I just remember like nothing about it. It just I remember seeing it. But after that, I think they go back to like a back to perfection. So there's a lot of characters that reprise their roles. Like Melvin comes back. Um, I think Mindy comes back or something. And then there might be a movie where they cover the origins, but I don't know for sure. 
I don't have six hours in my life to watch Tremors three, four, five, and six. <laughs> um, I might Wikipedia it. Oh, you do. I'm, I'm kind of interested in the back to perfection thing where they bring back a lot of people from the town in this movie just to see what they do. Like, is Melvin still a punk? Like what the deal is? Did he grow up? I hope. No, he's still the same age. <laughs> he went to Neverland. Turn <laughs> right Please, to Neverland. We're trapped here. <laughs> oh, so actually that's Tremors three back to perfection. The now famous Burt Gummer returns to his hometown of perfection. Oh, to the hometown of perfection, Nevada, for the first time in years. But the deadliest graboid evolution yet forces him to save the town he swore to protect. There you go. I was well, right. It was Nevada. So, yeah, it's yeah. because Burt's there. Ariana Richards comes back as Mindy. Charlotte Stewart comes back as Nancy. Uh, Tony Gennaro comes back as Miguel. Bobby Jacoby comes back as Melvin. And I um, think they're the only well, people because everybody else is dead. Why did they go back? Uh, so they still live in perfection. Oh, they're just like, this problem yeah. solved. They, um, they stole the, the script, or not the script, but the plot line for the Spaceball sequel. <laughs> <laughs> the search for more money? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, there are so many more Tremors movies than I thought. There is, I thought there is just five. <laughs> there's Tremors 4, The Legend Begins. Oh my god, it takes place in Wild West times. There's Tremors 5, Bloodlines. I think that's the one with Jamie Kennedy. Then there's Tremors 6, A Cold Day in Hell. <laughs> what? <laughs> there's the 2003 Tremors, the series. And then evidently in 2018, there was going to be a Tremors reboot, like a television reboot of the movie. Um, that I guess Kevin Bacon was going to come back for. They were going to try to get Fred Ward to come back for it, but it didn't end up getting picked up. So it just kind of fell by the wayside. Interesting. So yeah, things get interesting over time. Tremors 4, a prequel to Tremors. The movie tells us about the, how the town of Perfection, Nevada became founded and how they defended it against the Graboids with the help of Burt Gummer's ancestor, Hiram. So Michael Gross plays an ancestor of Bert as they defend a Wild West town from Graboids. I have never seen it. I cannot speak on it. I just know it looks interesting. What about Shrieker Island? Oh, is that another one? Yeah, it came out in 2020. What? <laughs> Starring Michael Gross. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and John Heater. <laughs> So I guess that is the the newest one, because then Tremors Five Bloodlines, um, Jamie Kennedy comes in as some character, I think Travis, and it's Bert and Travis battle ass blasters and graboids in South Africa. Cold you say day ass in hell. blasters. Yeah, that's the third evolution of them. They're called ass blasters. Okay. They burst and then fly through the air. Uh, Tremors a cold day in hell. The new sequel finds Bert Gummer, who's dying from graboid poison. And his son Travis at a remote station in Canada's none of it territory where they must go up against a new batch of graboids to save Bert's life. Interesting. Which then brings us to Tremor Shrieker Island. When a group of They're hunters. Like ge- They're like Velociraptors in this one. Yeah. When a group of hunters genetically modify graboid eggs, they face an all out war against the larger, terrifyingly intelligent graboids and the swiftly multiplying Shriekers. These are Utah graboids. That is with Michael Gross, John Hader, and Richard Brake. Interesting. I will end up watching all of these. Um, (laughs) I laugh. Suddenly you have six hours. But I know there will be one Friday night where I'm just like, it's 10 o'clock. What am I doing? You know what? I'm not going to sleep tonight. Let's just catch up on every Tremors film. (laughs) <laughs> I did download the first five with the intention of watching it because there was some big anniversary or event that happened, I think, two, three years ago, and I just never got around to watching the rest of them. Yeah, because I think they did the 30th anniversary and they did some hullabaloo out in California for it. And I think Michael Gross is the only one who showed up to it, which he's the, <laughs> the only consistent person throughout the entire film line. So Wasn't he hospitalized, you know, for carrying this film series? <laughs> Well, oh, that explains the brace in four, five, and six. Yeah. <laughs> we are wildly uh, tangent here. 
it all makes sense together. So that was our <laughs> brief interlude into the history of the Tremor series. Um, so I guess <laughs> they, it goes all the way up to Tremors. It gets to the point where they stop using numbers and they go like the the Scream Halloween Friday the 13th route of just Tremors, Shrieker Island. No number. So back to them. Rhonda, Val, and Earl are on this rock and kind of waxing about what things or kind of what our origins these things have. That's how we got there. We were wondering about the origin story. So Val wants to test and see if it's still there. He ends up finding out that it senses sound because it knows when they're hitting the ground. And Rhonda ends up kind of confirming like, oh, that would make sense. They, they live in the ground. They sense vibrations. Yada, yada. So the next day they're still stuck. So Rhonda comes up with the whole plan of they're going to take these poles and they're going to pull volt rock to rock until they can get to the truck. And they kind of realize, which I think it's Val who says it like, that's why Edgar never left the power lines. He realized that they were underground. And I like how they all put two and two together pretty quick. It's just like, oh, that makes sense. Yep. So that's why Edgar was up there and up. Yep. That makes sense. Why the car ended up like underground. She hid in it or whatever. So they pull Volt truck to truck to what I assume sounds like a rusted root song. And I'm curious as to why the Graboids don't hear the poles. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that was one of my little like logic things. So they should be grabbing like- onto that and stealing it as soon as... <laughs> Because they can hear them walking around the rocks. They know where they are. I expected them to do that. They just like go to put the pole down and it just opens its mouth and they just (laughs) drop clean in. It's like that scene in that one shark movie where the guy just drives into the shark's mouth on the jet ski. Just goes (laughs) goes right in. Is that one of the Sharknado films? I don't know. It's I don't know. Is that shark? It's It's in one of the it's one of those scenes in those like bad movie compilations you see on YouTube. But oh, it's like Megalodon versus Sharktopus <laughs> featuring Lorenzo Lamas. I'm 98% sure that's a real film. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably I think right. I remember stocking it at Blockbuster. Didn't fly off the shelves. So, yeah. So, curious as to why the things didn't go after the poles when they're hitting the ground with it. But they ended up, they get it to the, the truck. They managed to make it away. And we're <laughs> back to Walter's. Yet again, speaking of them making it away, like she was steering and driving pretty well on that road for having no idea. What well, she was. I was wondering because so she ends up going into the, the truck, like through the window head first. And she like reaches down and puts her hand on the gas pedal to take off. But it all of a sudden it's like it's following along the road. And she's like <laughs> a little help here. How well, is they're, she they're steering? going about 30, 40 miles an hour. Yeah, How is she geez. steering along the road? <laughs> When she's like head first, unless like she just reached down to put her hand on the pedal and then she like boosted herself back up to see. I don't know. <laughs> well, they are kind of just in the middle of the desert. Just go straight and hope to not hit anything. But she, she was, followed a followed dirt road, road perfectly. <laughs> she was like hugging corners. <laughs> she drifted. <laughs> She pops the e-brake. It's just you, you hear the Tokyo Drift music come in. Dun, 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 dun. But yeah, I just thought that was another logically funny thing. Like she's driving very well with her hand, <laughs> one hand on the gas pedal. So, yeah. So we're back to Walter's yet again. And Walter is trying to reach Bert and Heather because they ended up going off to try to see who else they can help get back to their house, so on and so forth. And they fill everybody else in on the the Graboids. And that's when Val determines that they need to leave because they're working their way to perfection. He grabs the map and he shows they attacked uh, Edgar over here. They attacked old Fred here. They attacked the workers here. They're working their way towards the town. So them hunkering down is not going to save them. And once again, Melvin's a little shit because Melvin ends up pretending that he got attacked yet again. And I think this is when he throws his basketball in or something to the, the store at Val. <laughs> I scared you, didn't I? <laughs> you little ass wipe. You don't knock it off, you're gonna be <laughs> shitting this basketball. And he goes back outside and he's just bouncing his ball and the ball gets taken by a graboid and then we hear him screaming. So 
everybody assumes that he's lying for like the third time in two hours in this movie. And literally all of them band together to go kick his ass. Like, damn it, I'm gonna kick his ass. I'm gonna help him. And then the entire like general store gets up and walks out with them. <laughs> like, I wanna, they're like, world star. <laughs> I wanna see this ass beating. <laughs> Catch these hands, Melvin. <laughs> <laughs> which i would have loved it if they go out and melvin's like halfway because he climbs up the pole to get away and it's like his legs bleeding and it's like oh which i love if they grab him and pull him down from the pole and then just start beating him victor wong's in the corner trying to get bets from people on how long he'll last <laughs> <laughs> he's scrappy I'll give you five to one odds. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so the the Graboid scatters everyone uh, out there and proceeds to attack Walter's shop while ming is still pogoing outside and they try to stop her. Which I don't know why after all of this happened, after we already know there's been multiple murders, which whether we know there's something underground or not, you know there's been multiple murders in town, at least four, and Nancy still let Mindy just go pogoing off by herself in town. Out of the entire movie, this is the main (laughs) thing that I look at as like, really? (laughs) The fact that they haven't ostracized Melvin, and why do they let her pogo? I mean, thought she could use it as a weapon? I don't know. Bait? (laughs) They're just, they're listening to the pogo and they know once the pogo stops, that's when it's gotten to town. <laughs> they're using her as like, like their line of system. cans on a string. <laughs> yeah. Their version of that. Yeah. The opposite. So yeah. So Mindy is pogoing around outside. Val makes a mad dash for it and is able to save her in time. And then Rhonda ends up getting tangled in barbed wire while running away from all of this. And one begins pulling her in which Val then comes to her rescue with a, a pickaxe, which it's amusing that earlier in the movie, I think it's, they say um, to Nestor, like, oh, what are you going to do? And he's like, oh, if I see one, I'm going to jam it with a pickaxe. And they're like, oh, that won't work. You'll never see it coming. And then it's attacking Rhonda, and then Val grabs a pickaxe and hits it with a pickaxe. And it's like, actually, Nestor might have been right. It didn't <laughs> kill it, but it worked. It slowed him down. Yeah, so Val helps rescue her with the the pickaxe and helps her escape from her pants, and they (laughs) run to the... (laughs) That's, I mean... That's after this is all said and done. (laughs) After the credits. Um, (laughs) So yeah, she's tangled in barbed wire, so she takes her pants off so they can run away. And I like this effect of them running back into Walter's store and all of the boards in the, the general yeah. store outside, like all do the wave yeah, leading up to cool. them. I did like that. I was still curious how they did the Bugs Bunny effect every time they had the graboids going under the ground and moving and you could see the earth like moving in the spot where it's heading in the direction of. I thought that was really cool They that they did throughout the movie. Let's have the director on and we'll ask him. I wonder if it's just they dug out like a, a trench, did like a tarp, covered the tarp with whatever it is to act as land. And then this way they can just move like a, I don't know. There is a point later on where you, you can see it's like a wide shot with the, I forget everybody's name, Val and Rhonda. They're standing on, you can tell they're like standing on a wooden platform. It's like covered in dirt. So I think it's probably, you're probably right. It's like, it's a trench that's covered in covered with something and dirt and like, they're just pulling a big sack of potatoes under the ground. <laughs> yeah, I figured it was like some kind of bladder or something that they just inflate and drag. Oh, yeah, across. that's, you know what, that's probably more accurate. Come to find out they actually created a real... <laughs> a new species. ...subterranean armored worm, trained it for years. <laughs> that's why this was a $176 million budget. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so they're back in Walters again. Miguel uh, 
brings Rhonda a pants. The freezer vibrates, which we talked about at the top of the film, except now it's relevant. And everybody rushes to stop it, but a graboid bursts through the ground and gets poor Walter. Which, in his dying words, he said, I trademark the term graboids and then get sucked <laughs> underground. Like, damn, he said it. We have to abide that as law now. <laughs> Val just screams after him. It'll never hold up in court. <laughs> Walter just has like one one middle finger out of the ground as he goes down like the like Terminator 2. So yeah, poor Walter gets taken. Everybody plays the most serious game of the floor is lava as they try to get to the roof because I think Miguel, Val, and Earl are on the, the freezer thing. Rhonda ends up on one of the, like the center of the store shelves, and all of them are trying to get back up to the roof, but the graboid pushes one of them and causes kind of a domino effect. Rhonda gets tossed out the window while the rest of them make it up there, but they end up finding like she makes it to the water tower, and uh, Melvin continues to be the worst thing ever. I don't remember what he specifically did at this point. I just, in my notes, she was in trouble. I think you might be thinking of earlier. When she was in trouble. It's actually how I end every section of my notes in this episode. <laughs> For every scene, it just ends with Melvin is the worst. Melvin needs to be better. Earlier when she was under attack, he was like, just shut her out of the shed. Or he just like ran in and was like, I'm not helping. It's like the bullies in Monster Squad. When Horace is stuck outside. Let me exactly. in, EJ. Exactly. So we end up going back to Bert and Heather who are at their compound of some sort. They're like a barricade house. So Heather spots the town all hanging out on the roofs, the roofs, and they radio in about kind of everything that's going on. Heather turns on her bullet vibrator machine. I don't, I'm not a gun person. I don't know what exactly it is that she was using. But she I kind a, of am, and I didn't even know what the hell that was. Like, is that supposed to clean the bullet casings or something? I don't know what the hell that was about. oh like if she you was don't collecting just... her empty casings and do they make their own bullets or something oh you know what that's it's probably a, it it's, it's probably a like a sand sifter it's or a, something it's a casing tumbler and it turns them into nice smooth rocks for it's like decoration because either that or he's just so <laughs> in the future shop. <laughs> that he just puts the the black powder and the bullets and the casings in the thing and they shake it hard enough and it's just it auto creates bullets for them. <laughs> it's the crafting station. Yeah, I was yeah. Say, it's like arc. Um, yeah. Cause she ends up taking them and putting them into this like rumble tumbler full of sand and then just turns it on, which because it vibrates, it then attracts all the graboids from town and brings them to the Gummer residence, which as a kid, this I think was my favorite scene in the movie, just because I always thought like, Oh, that's so cool because yeah. the, for Bert, first of all, for Bert being so smart throughout most of this movie, he's dumb in this scene because they call him on the radio and they say they're in the ground, they're underground, they're monsters, they're coming for you because they hear the vibration. And he just like stops and then he just like walks over to the window and looks out the window and it's Bert, they're underground. What are you looking for if that's the case? Did they actually say it was underground to him? Because I didn't catch that. Yeah, they say they're underground, and then he goes back to the radio, and they're like, they repeat like, Bert, they're under the ground, they're under the ground. Big, big like a son of a bitch, big monster, underground, now get out, hurry. And then instead of like leaving, he just takes like three steps back, and they just walk over to like the the wall to just kind of like prepare their guns, and mm. then a graboid bursts through the wall, which is always a fun scene because the graboid bursts through the wall. And prepares to attack the uh, the Gummer residents with their wall of guns, which as they're grabbing, <laughs> which them, is a I great reveal. Assume, yeah, which <laughs> it's like this quick pan of it bursts through one wall. They have their guns, and then they walk over to the they, opposite. They retreat wall, to and the it's arsenal. It's just a floor to ceiling, side to side wall <laughs> of all of these guns. Which the thing that is interesting is the fact that they're just like firing 
some like at one point they ask for another clip he tosses his wife a clip but then they just drop the gun grab something else from the wall and just start firing drop it grab something else from the wall which means that they leave every gun loaded on that yeah. wall <laughs> that is not proper gun safety i'm not a gun person i don't think that's safe <laughs> well earlier well, when um, handy. when um earl and val were like escaping in the car and Earl was reloading the Colt pistol. He and he's just casually talking as like they're hitting every bump. The gun is oh, clearly yeah. aimed at Kevin Bacon, his fingers on the trigger. I'm just shaking my head thinking, you know, didn't they learn any trigger discipline back then? <laughs> yeah, so that he shoots him. It's like pulp fiction. Rhonda looks out the back window and they're like, ooh. So yeah, so they then proceed to use every gun ever to kill this thing which i like how bert then destroys this thing with an absolute unit of a shotgun it's like this giant elephant gun that he smashes a glass case open loads these giant cartridges and or the shells into and then just takes two blasts into this thing and kills it in the jurassic park sequel that is the gun that Roland was going to shoot the Rex with. Oh, in Lost World? Yeah. I wonder what it would have done. I think it's like it's, I think it's the same kind of gun that uh the hunter in Jumanji uses too. Which yeah, if that's on the Alan. case. My God. <laughs> well, it literally is called an elephant gun, and that's yeah. exactly what it's meant for. Is It'll to end your elephants. life. <laughs> Which means that in Jumanji, if he actually connected with any of that. <laughs> <laughs> just, obliterate any body yeah, part you got there it just removes them from like the waist to chest and it's, <laughs> it's just like a, a head and two arms fall down next to two unattached legs yeah the dinner plate holes that were being shot into the wall wasn't from buckshot that's just the size of the slug that's getting shot at them <laughs> <laughs> just one solid bullet that's just like seven inches by seven inches so They finally end up killing this thing. The gummers head to the roof in celebration. They radio in that... We killed it! You got that? We killed that mother humper! Come back! (laughs) Uh, Roger that, Bert, and uh, congratulations. Be advised, however, there are two more, repeat, two more mother humpers. So the Graboids get smart at this point. They begin taking out the foundations to all of the houses because all of a sudden all of them start rattling, which I guess makes sense if they can travel easily through dirt they can just run circles under the foundations weaken the the ground and then they're just like all unstable so i mean it it makes sense as far as that and then they take out the trailer that Nestor is on top of so he ends up running and hiding on top of a tire and then gets sucked clean through the center of the tire yeah that was that was a cool death i guess which there was really other than melvin there was nobody in this movie that was like oh i hate this person so it's like all of them it's oh that's disappointing it's like i liked walter Nestor. i had no big thoughts on yeah he didn't really do much i figured he was gonna die because once they showed him again i was like oh yeah he hasn't really done anything he's gonna get killed (laughs) (laughs) i mean it's usually when i have to stop and think like wait what was that guy's name and i'm like hey then that means it probably he's already he's already gone he's already gone he looks dead at the screen at me and he's like, Nestor, my name is Nestor. What have I done? Remember me. <laughs> so yeah, so Nestor gets got. He gets pulled through the, the tire and he's gone. Which at this point, this is when the, the Gummer truck gets taken out the same way that a lot of the other ones do. Because their whole plan is they're going to jump into this truck. They're going to go get help and they're going to come back. And then Bert and Heather end up watching as their car ends up getting... Like the tires blown out and partially sucked into the ground. And then that's when Val and Earl get the idea of we need to take the bulldozer because the cat can get through anything. So they're going to take the bulldozer, attach it to the trailer, pull the trailer, and take everybody in a convoy to safety. Roger that, 10 4, little buddy. Convoy. We got ourselves a convoy. <laughs> <laughs> they missed the opportunity to use that song. <laughs> Little too on the nose, maybe? I don't know. They're playing that song, and that's what attracts the Graboids. 
then they realize they look at each other in horror. It's Reba singing her cover of the song. You're like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's not even on the radio. They slowly turn around. And she's just in the back. <laughs> And all that, you managed to grab your guitar, too, Reba. <laughs> Singing into the barrel of her gun she like a microphone. Stare her, lo- lowers her eyes at them, just staring at them when she sings this one. <laughs> <laughs> so I like how they decide that they need to have a decoy. And then Earl says, hey, Melvin, you want to make a buck? <laughs> <laughs> Give this shithead a jab. Unfortunately, Melvin is not used as the decoy. Miguel ends up having the idea to take the like the mini tractor that Walter has and they're going to flip the thing on, send it off into the wild blue yonder and let that attract the graboids from there on out. So Val and Earl once again do rock, paper, scissors to determine this time who is going to make the run or kind of who can make the run to the bulldozer. Earl wants to go because he doesn't want Val to get hurt. Val wants to go. He doesn't want Earl to get hurt. So Earl ends up winning. He decides he's going to go. and then. Val sucker punches him so he can make the run for the bulldozer. So the tractor gives out before Val even makes it to the bulldozer. So Earl and the crew end up making noise just to attract it. So he could end up getting to it, gets to the bulldozer. The bulldozer collects the crew. It goes, they collect the the gummers and uh, Bert refuses to give Melvin a gun. Don't know why Melvin's not a useless person. He's proved himself to be a great asset. <laughs> Please give me a weapon. I'm a coward. I don't know why they bothered even bringing some of the smaller caliber weapons anyway, considering the no damage any of them did until he brought out the elephant rifle. Now, right. The dark thing is they brought them because they knew if they couldn't kill them with a large caliber and they were going to be stuck out in the desert on a rock, those were for them. That was well, all the 30 bullets. <laughs> In multiple <laughs> magazines. Just hey, I don't know sure. how many it takes to kill Melvin, but I know how many they're going to use. <laughs> Why didn't you shoot me in the head? <laughs> <laughs> One in each arm. Stay still. You can't catch me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So they're all kind of doing this exodus. Their idea is let's take the bulldozer. We'll get up to the, the mountains. This way they can't get through the mountains. We can take off from there. The bulldozer can get through anything. And they see the things kind of running up ahead and they don't know what's going on which they're like oh just ignore it like as long as they're over there that's fine come to find out they are weakening the ground turning it into a sinkhole to trap the bulldozer as it falls in and scatters all of them out of the trailer thing there i thought for sure miguel was gonna get it here like i haven't seen this in ages and at the top of this movie, I thought Miguel and Nancy both die by the end of it. I was pleasantly surprised because I'm like, I like Miguel and I don't mind Nancy. <laughs> Nancy's fine. I think it's just they haven't given her enough <laughs> no, stuff. She, no, she doesn't really. Her or uh, the little girl. Yeah. I mean, although I think the the only thing they really give Nancy to do in this is the conversation with them in the beginning when they're trying to get to Bixby and it's. It'll last a couple months. I'll toss in free beer. But other than that, it's like she doesn't really get a lot of time yeah. to shine herself. So it's so I, you, you you figure everybody's like fodder then for like the monsters, but yeah, only a couple deaths outside of the nameless people that die at the beginning. But well, at one nameless, point when but, you, um, you know. when you hear the pogo stick going and they're doing the POV of the thing coming in, I was sitting here and I'm like, I haven't seen it in years, but I don't think they kill the girl (laughs) would have had balls if they did (laughs) melvin decides now's the time he's gonna rush and try to save mindy they get out just in time to see both of them get taken (laughs) (laughs) so yeah so they fall into a sinkhole bert uses a pipe bomb that he built to frighten them off and then they decide "We'll, we'll frighten them off that way we can run to the other rocks melvin doesn't want to go so bert gives him a gun which they end up running and then Melvin ends up like, first of all, they used the sound to drive them away and now they're trying to run there. So the first thing Melvin does is take the gun and then try to shoot, which I assume like is going to be ineffective and also attract them even worse. But luckily Bert didn't give him bullets. So it's just an empty revolver as he's trying to run through there. (laughs) 
And I like how Melvin complains once they get to the rocks and gives him the gun back. And Bert's like, oh, like, but it got you moving. And Bert knows he gave it to him empty, but still checks it when he receives it. Because it's like, okay, so you left all the guns on your wall loaded. But this, you give him an empty gun. He hands it back to you. And you still like, you keep your finger off the trigger. As you're talking, he like opens it, looks at it, puts the like chamber or whatever back in the cylinder and then puts it back in his pocket. And it's, it was just kind of a throwaway little character thing if he's just did that. I don't know if it's just Michael Gross deciding to do that or if it was in the script, but it's it just seems, safety, man. yeah, it just seems fun that it's like, no, that would make sense if Bert is like this hardcore gun person of like, yeah, he would probably follow proper safety procedures Protocol. with that. Only thing that throws it off is all of the stuff in his house. They weren't, though. They they were grabbing mags as they grabbed new guns. Yeah. They weren't loaded. They weren't loaded. Oh, did you go back and check? No, I yeah. knew. Just you were going on a, a roll, and I didn't want to <laughs> interrupt I'm, for I'm a minor petty bubble. detail. Yeah, they grabbed in, mags. Interrupt for petty details. <laughs> but it's a lot of huge respect to have that, because even though he knew it was loaded or not loaded when he was given the gun, and receiving it, that's there needs to be more of that. What if uh, Melvin never tried to fire the gun, and then they got to the rock, and then he just turned it on? <laughs> Gross. <laughs> I've been waiting for this. And he pulls it, and you know there's no bullets. <laughs> and then, and then just like, ah, oh, no bullets. <laughs> Think I'm stupid, Hans? Then they just toss uh, toss Melvin into the, into the dirt. <laughs> the only thing that you took me shit. out of the movie was his insistence on bringing all that ammunition. And that shit's going to be 60 pounds of literal dead weight for a gun that is ineffective against it. So why bother bringing all that extra ammo for nothing? Yeah, just bring the bombs. The bombs or he throws all that ammo onto the dirt, the things eat it, and then slowly over the course of years, they digest it and get lead poisoning. <laughs> the long game. <laughs> the long game. Just got to find enough food and water to and shelter to last. Just last this thing out. <laughs> We gave the crap boys cancer. <laughs> <laughs> little by little, over ages. <laughs> we've been feeding them, but we've been crushing up little bits of glass. <laughs> <laughs> so so they're all trapped on the rock. Um, and Bert decides, he, he says, If it comes to starvation, I know what I'm doing. Take one of these. Walk right out there with the fuse lit and let them take me down. Boom. Good lord, honey. <laughs> which Earl says, actually, that's a good idea. Which gives them the idea <laughs> of they need to go fishing. It would have been great if he's like, that's a great idea. And he just lights it and runs off into the distance. <laughs> now, that's not a bad idea. No, no, it gives me an idea. Get all right up. We just strap first. it to Melvin. <laughs> yeah, so they decided to do the idea of fishing. They're going to tie the bombs to the end of, um, like, the rope or whatever and lasso it out there. They're going to throw some rocks, draw its attention, throw the bomb out, let it eat it. And they use it to kill the the first one, which I like how they ask. He mentions like, oh, it's the the whatever extended wicks, um, like cannon wicks. And they're like, what do you use that for? And he's like, yeah. my cannon. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great line. It's just so like the entire thing is just so matter of fact that Bert and Heather are fun because it's not they're not ever made like there's no joke made of them. They're not a punchline. It's just like. No, this is just this is how we are. Like, no, it's yeah. our canon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was a good line. So, yeah, I mean, if I if I lived with like a thousand acres of desert around me, I would definitely become a gun nut because yeah, <laughs> there's there's no res- like there's you know owning several guns you in Massachusetts suburbia is kind of sketch, but when it comes to just living in the middle of nowhere, fuck it, why not? <laughs> Where, yeah, where you just have like miles and miles and miles of desert behind your house. And it's, I can just set up targets and just kind of play around out here. We have dune buggies, dirt bikes, guns. Target practice on a dirt bike. (laughs) It's like uh, 
what's that cross country winter sport where they ski yeah, and the then they like shoot and they ski? Yeah. It's the the land or the summer version. They take a dirt bike and a <laughs> rifle. But you have to dress up like the Mad Max characters and shoot crossbows instead. <laughs> Two, no, you have to use a boomerang with steel tips. <laughs> they were just waiting for Melvin to come of age so they can tie him to the front of the tractor so he can do the blood bag. <laughs> Yeah, they, when they put him on the end of the bulldozer, witness him. When what's his name, Bert becomes infected, and then Melvin becomes a blood bank. <laughs> they do transfusions <laughs> with graboid poison. <laughs> I need to watch him now. I need to know what this is about. <laughs> so they kill one of the graboids using this fishing technique, and they try to do it with the second one, but old Stumpy, which the the one that they pulled the original snake off of that Walter bought off of them. He's still alive and it is missing one. So they call it Stumpy because it's it's missing one tongue. So that one doesn't end up going for the, the bait and ends up kind of reversing it on them because they throw the bomb out there. They think it takes it. And instead he spits the bomb back out. And not only does he spit it back out, he spits it and it lands right in their pile of other bombs and then blows up and scatters most of them like off into the distance where now Val is the only one who still has a bomb left. He wishes his graboid friends were alive. So he could have told them like how cool that was. (laughs) What you just did was fucking awesome. He spits it as they throw another one. It hits both bombs in (laughs) midair. It just keeps deflecting anything they throw at him. (laughs) So, yeah. So first of all, I don't know why they kept a, duffel like a knapsack full of pipe bombs all together right there um clanking around yeah i mean or even like maybe keep a couple in different spots i would never like if i only had one object that i know could potentially kill this thing i wouldn't stack all of them in a pile by themselves like who knows melvin trips over there and knocks the bag over onto the dirt and now they don't have any of them who knows who knows? So Val gets an idea. So Val's idea is he just takes off running. I like how as soon as he just starts running, Earl just goes along with him because he's like, I have an idea. And Earl's like, okay. And he just starts running with him with like no explanation. And then they realize they don't have the lighter. So Rhonda has it. So she has to start running with them. So Rhonda lights the, the pipe bomb. Val gets to the edge of the cliff. He throws it misses the graboid that lands behind it but it turns out that he actually is using it to explode and drive the graboid super speed yeah, forward scare him. so he can play chicken and then dive out of the way as this thing goes flying out of the ground and off the cliff where it just explodes on the ground like a flesh hot pocket <laughs> Those things are glass cannons. <laughs> they truly are. <laughs> like gravity is just their destroyer. Their destroyer. <laughs> yeah, that's uh he exclaimed loudly, like, these things aren't smarter than us. And he's right, he outsmarted it. <laughs> They're not smarter than us, and then he trips and falls off the cliff. <laughs> so yeah, that's this is when we get the Can you fly, you sucker? line from Val which to answer his point they cannot yet watch the third one so Val jokes that well it just suddenly hit me you know stampede (laughs) it kind of harkens back to the story at the beginning of like oh when such and such happened when Earl was telling the story about what started this whole stampede and all of these things coming straight at him so it's just, again, bookends. Val and Earl decides to go to Bixby finally, and they're hoping to get into like a National Geographic or a People's Magazine, you know, the big two from 1990. <laughs> big. And Val chases after Rhonda to make his move, which I guess originally the first cut that went before a test audience was not having this kiss at the end. It was supposed to be like they both, Val and Earl take off from Bixby, and then he's like, oh, like, do you have a lighter? And then he remembers, oh, Rhonda has my lighter. So it's, 
okay, and they have to go back and go get their lighter, and you think, oh, okay, so they're going to end up together. Like, he purposely needs this just so he can go back and see Rhonda. But I guess audiences hate ambiguity, so they ended up deciding, let's just tack it in that they directly go back, and it's, hey, I want to be with you, and then they kiss and end this movie. They should have cut it. I, I need that kiss. Did they, though? They had zero chemistry through the whole movie. I felt the- Earl had more chemistry with Rhonda than Val did. Which I like all of their characters together, but to me, the big relationship of the movie isn't Val and Rhonda. It's the relationship between Val and Earl. Yeah, like, it wasn't a it wasn't a romance, it was a bromance. Yeah. Of them like, oh, it's them two against everything else, and them two like making their decisions for how they need to change their life. It would have ended better for me if it was the two of them finally getting to ride off to Bixby. And it's like, it doesn't mean you have to break things with Rhonda. It's like, she knows where you are. They could have a moment of like, hey, we're going off to Bixby. You know how to find us. Like, it'd be great to see you. But then let them ride off into the sunset because that finishes what we started of them trying to get out of town together and start something new. Yeah, a whole, a more wholesome version of the Dumb and Dumber ending. Can you explain to me why there's just a little moment and maybe I'm dumb. She comes up to like take a picture of them and he reaches in and grabs these pictures that are on the. So uh, those were all of a former girl that he, I guess, was dating or knew. Okay. Because in the beginning of the movie, Earl is ribbing him about like when they first, I guess, meet Rhonda. He's like, Rhonda's a nice girl. Like Rhonda seems great. And then he points out like the was it Tammy Lee Baker or something like that. And Val corrects him. And he's like, you're chasing after like the wrong type of woman and whatever. Yeah, okay. Oh, that and the pictures come up there. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're on the up. where you usually put your car keys. Yeah. Trope. Yeah. Yeah. On she comes up close. Sunvisor. He didn't want her to see him, so he. Yeah. Okay. Down. Okay. I just missed. It was, I just. It was pictures of all the those. other women in perfection that he's killed and hid throughout the years. <laughs> That's the real turn in this movie. <laughs> Why do you think Kevin Bacon is out in the middle of nowhere working a dead end handyman job? He well, he can't kill her. He was hoping for her. He only kills blondes with long legs. <laughs> That's why he was unsure about really like getting to know her. Like you're not my type. <laughs> you find out that the long blonde hair that he has in the movie isn't his. He like goes back to his trailer and takes the hat off and then like removes it and puts it on a mannequin. Turns the lamp on off with the skin shade. <laughs> But he has a clapper, but he doesn't use his hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So that's our version of Tremors. Now, so that's where we kind of end it. They end up together, which I guess leading into the second movie makes sense because I think they both are together and that's why they're not in the next movie, which I don't know if that was ever the intention originally or they just they decided to tack it on based on this. And then we get an end credits Reba song. To which no one dies. (laughs) I think that means everybody dies. I think that means the end of the movie. Yeah. Reba brings about the end of the film. So I still love it. I think rewatching it now, it is, I wouldn't like to me, it's a, like a horror action comedy, maybe action comedy horror. But first and foremost in my head, I don't think horror movie. I think monster movie. Yeah, yeah. Like this is closer to something like a, I mean, a little less serious, but this is closer to something like a Jaws than it is to any other type of like scary movie. Yeah, horror can cross over with monsters, but this isn't that. It's it's a monster movie. Almost like Deep Blue Sea at a couple of points. Yeah, like it's much more in that vein. Although to me, Deep Blue Sea is a horror movie. I think it's because they try to do more... There's more like suspense and jump scares and I'm, blue I'm just saying because it's sharks. That's, that's the only reason. <laughs> I, I am personally horrified at the sharks. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, what is a graboid but a land shark? Um, yeah, I like I like Tremors. It's funny going into it. I was gonna be like, I didn't know how much I would have to say about it before I even watch it because I'm like, I remember liking this movie. I think it's just gonna be like a fun little rewatch, and it was. It was. I I don't know. For me, it's just entertaining i'm entertained by the two leads and the chemistry and um just the monster shit going on so i wouldn't say it's a groundbreaking i would just think it's like an enjoyable movie 
A flick, yeah, if you're, popcorn if you're a kid in the 1990s and this is on USA Network, I would sit my butt down and watch Tremors. Yeah. So, yeah. So go, Just for the one F-bomb. <laughs> so go check out Tremors. It's certainly fun. At some point, check out Tremors 2. At some point, I will check out Tremors 3 through 6 um, just to wrap my head around everything that happens in this thing. Mm-hmm. But that's a story for another day. So thank you for coming along for the adventure on Tremors. As always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Screen Refresh, or email us your own movie memories at screenrefresh at gmail.com. If you like the show, help us out and leave a rating or a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to help others find us. For Nick and Dean, I'm Tim. We'll see you again in a couple weeks on Rule of Thirds.